one of the other important crop or crop group of crops in the Skagit Valley is is vegetable seed. Um, this is a, a, a special special place for agriculture and it's specialized and uh, there's a combination of factors that make this uniquely qualified to do vegetable seeds and we're here uh, looking at uh, cabbage seed and I'm going to let Jack uh, the farmer introduce himself and talk a bit about his farm. Um, my name is Jack Holbert. I'm a fourth generation farmer in the valley, um, third generation cabbage seed grower. My grandfather, the first crop we know of was in 1919. He grew a large crop and got paid a darn good price for 101 years ago. <laughs> and we've been um, producing seed since then. We, along with cabbage seed, vegetable seed, um, what spinach are the kind of, seed. What other kind of vegetable seeds do you grow? Beet seed. Uh, spinach seed, cabbage seed, Brussels sprouts, kale, and for rotation we've kind of just been gone to growing cover crop and uh, mowing it because rotational crops are a tough one. We've lost a lot of money trying to make money on a rotational crop. It just so you're you're primarily a seed crop grower. Yeah, and you for your crop rotations it's 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 cover crops to break up the which is which is tough to, to break, break the disease cycle you can only grow a brassica the rotation should be five years is what we're shooting for and uh to find a crop th that you can grow four years and make money on is a tough one so we're trading ground mainly isolations are real important with cabbage you have to have at least a mile away in between crops in between cabbage fields so if two, two miles would be better but a mile is what our standard is so if you grow this field there is not another cabbage field within a mile or two of this correct and what's the significance of why does that have to be a mile or two for the bees for cross-pollination so they don't cross-pollinate so they don't cross-pollinate and now with with DNA testing it's becoming even more it's becoming more important because it's not only the bees, but uh, wind, other factors come into play. There's a lot of blueberries grown in the valley. Blueberries require a high, a high volume of bees per acre because the blueberry flower is really hard for bees to work. So if they see a big yellow cabbage field, they'd much rather go there and fill their bellies and their pollen sacs instead of going to a mess with a blueberry flower. So, so how many cabbage seed fields do Maybe Bern. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Bern Holbert. I'm an agronomist for a vegetable seed company located here in the valley. Uh, okay, I don't know which one of you can answer this, but how many cabbage seed fields might there be in the sketch battle? Don probably has a better idea. Yeah. It's probably 20 to 30, 30. Depending on the year. 20 to 30. Yeah. And so all of those have to be isolated. isolated. So you have these maps where people put pins on and all the growers work together and the seed companies work together to keep their fields spread out. Yeah, I think it's even more complicated because it's, it's, we're not working for a seed company. The genetics that go into these seed crops are proprietary. So the grower, Jack, never owns the crop. Jack's contracted to raise the crop for the seed company. So you're growing this crop, but you don't own this crop. No. Who um, owns this crop? Uh, this crop is owned by uh, Bijou Seeds in the by, Nether, by a seed Warman company. Housing and yeah. we'll produce the seed, deliver it to their specifications. The, the, um, this crop actually started negotiations 24 months ago. It's been growing for 18 months. And then after we deliver the seed, there'll be another three or four months of testing, DNA testing, grow outs, quality testing, quality testing and then they'll say, okay, we'll pay you for it. Okay, I noticed that there's a lot of space between these rows. Uh, can you explain a little bit about how this crop is, is grown and why there's a space here? The, these are where the male plants that produce the pollen. What yeah, you see here are different. the females that are left. The males, they've done their job and like in society, they're just tilled under. <laughs> they're done. And there are row, rows that we leave every Every 12 rows, we leave a blank row, blank that we call spray rows for fungicide applications. 
So there was maybe two or three rows? One. There were two rows oh, here. Two rows, you had two, two, to two rows here. So yeah. after pollination, you, you take them out. Yep. Okay. Uh, and you leave the, the females. Yeah. So, yep. And this is a biennial crop, so it's in here for a year two, and a half? Two years. Two years. A year and a half. Okay. Right now, we're sowing in the greenhouse the crop that we will plant so out you into transplant the fields. Yep. We'll transplant the end of August into the field. For next year's and then, August. And then that timing is very critical for the growth stage of the plant going into winter. If the plant gets too big, you'll get a big head and then it's, it's vulnerable to freeze out. So you want a smaller plant, but big enough that it'll vernalize and flower. A rule of thumb is 25 leaves. You need at least 25 leaves going into winter. And that can vary depending on the parent line. Because these are bred, the breeder is breeding for a niche market that, you know, that this is going to have a phytosanitary inspection by the state of Washington. And then that will allow it to be exported to the Netherlands and then re-exported from there to over 140 different countries. Can you tell us uh, what are some of the other crops that are grown for vegetable seed in the Skagit Valley? So we grow quite a bit of spinach um, and actually Brussels sprouts, cabbage, um, there's beet seed right over there that I think we're going to go to next. Um, I mean there's tons of it. Um, we also grow some, um, or, um, you do some kale yep. and then you also grow some mustard seed. Yeah, mustard seed. Yeah. Okay. And I want to introduce uh, Dr. Lindsay DeToy, who is a vegetable seed pathologist for Washington State University. And my first question for you, Lindsay, is how many vegetable seed pathologists are there in the world? <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> well, are there, are there a dozen? In the U.S., there's about a, there's about a half dozen public seed pathologists. And when it comes to vegetables, even fewer, um, maybe a couple of us. Um, it's, it's a small side of uh, plant pathology as a profession, and given how much seed is a critical role to agriculture, there's a need for more. <laughs> yeah, can, can you, I've, I've heard you talk, and I'm not sure what the exact question is, but can you talk about um, like how many acres there are maybe in Washington or in Skagit Valley, but what that translates into sure. to the actual vegetable crop? Sure, so a, a crop like cabbage, and it's highly variable depending on the type, but on average, they'll say maybe one acre of a hybrid cabbage seed crop produces enough seed to plant about 300 to 350 acres of a cabbage crop. So it's a one to 350 ratio. Um, and you look at all the cabbage that needs to be planted, there's, there's a fair amount of seed that you have to produce. If you get to a crop like spinach, um, because a lot of the seed that's produced in spinach seed crops goes to the baby leaf market, and baby leaf spinach crops are seeded at about three to four million seed per acre. It's a one to 10 ratio. So you need a tremendous amount of seed to supply the need of the baby leaf growers. Where does, where does the seed from the Skagit Valley end up being planted? So the seed that is harvested here ends up going to, as, as Bryn said, over 100 countries around the world. And the, all these seed crops that are going to be exported, if there's an export market, the importing country has requirements for inspections for certain pests or diseases or weeds. So the Washington State Department of Agriculture has a seed program that does all the seed, seed crop inspections. So they come through as, so many times a season, depending on the requirements of the importing country, and they have to look for certain pathogens or pests or diseases, they have to run tests on the harvested seed. It has to meet those phytosanitary certificate requirements that Jack mentioned. If it meets all those standards, then it can be exported to those countries. So seeds going all over the world from the Skagit Valley. That's amazing. That's awesome. Um, tell us about some of the pest problems. Now we're standing here uh, on day two of this <laughs> filming, and it has been raining most of the Absolutely. time. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. it's probably what 58, 60 degrees, and, <laughs> and raining all day. Yep. So. Yeah, what, so what does that mean? This is this is a big challenge, and and normally we we're going we're starting to get dry by now, and and ideally when the seed is forming on the crop, you want the conditions drier because fungal and bacterial pathogens of crops are favored typically by wet moisture, and so usually we we are dry in this area for about three months in the summer, and that makes it ideal for when the seed is maturing, so that you have low risk of fungal and and bacterial pathogens getting on the seed. But this this is very favorable. So uh, these fungi and bacteria, many of them are splash dispersed or wind and splash dispersed. So these windy, rainy conditions are ideal. 
Um, and so there, there's a lot of risk. And you can make a lot of money on the cabbage seed crop, but you can lose a lot of money because of the amount of risk. Hey, what's your company's tolerance for diseases on these seeds? Close to none. Close Dep to none. It depends on the disease. So, yeah. so a really good example in this area, um, a year ago we had a, a, a quarantine disease show up in this valley. Black leg? Black leg. Yeah. Um, not, not the potato black leg, but the brassica black leg pathogen showed up. and. A number of crops had to be destroyed because under the quarantine ruling that we have for Washington, which was put in place at the request of the seed growers to protect this region, if the disease shows up, the crop has to be destroyed. So the seed growers lost Everything. and the seed companies lost. Even more. And, and one of the things we were asked, to, I was asked to do as a seed pathologist is, is, is there a risk that this pathogen now has established in that area because it's not normally present. So we, with funding from the seed growers, uh, set up these spore traps that we monitored all winter long to see if the black leg pathogen was releasing its overwintered spore stage. So every week we'd pull these spore traps, it, the, the samples in from the spore traps and test them. And we showed that the, the drastic requirement of crop destruction was completely effective. We did not pick up any ascospores of the black leg pathogen all winter. Which is a good thing because this year, with this being so wet, if we if it had established it and we hadn't destroyed, we, we, if, we would if, have had a really if bad. If I could year. add, Lindsay was um, the number one on point on getting us a new fungicide registered. What well, what was that? Uh, Proline. Yep. And Pro in less in less than six months, we were able to start applying that. So with funding from the Washington State Commission Pesticide Registration and um, the Puget Sound Seed Growers Association, we did uh, efficacy trials, phytotoxicity trials. We want to make sure it's not going to damage the seed, make sure it doesn't damage the quality of the seed. Uh, we were able to show that it was safe to use. We were able to show it was really effective against black leg. And, and we did trials here as well as central Washington for the brassica crops that side. In I think one thing that makes it easier to get registrations on some of these seed crops is we have developed in Washington a path to registration that yeah. makes it easy. Can you talk a, a little bit about that? Sure. So it's you know the non-feed, non-food use. So these seed crops, the, the harvested seed never goes into immediate food chain or yeah. feed chain. Legally, it can't be. Legally, cannot. Be so used that for food. so that there is no issues or concerns about if you do put on a product like proline, if there's a little bit of residue on that seed, there's no risk because it's not going into a food or feed chain. And that's why we can get registrations fairly easily. Because you're exempt from tolerance. Exempt from tolerance. And so the regulatory hurdles are less. So, yep. And how many acres of cabbage seed are there in the state of Washington? Well, and that's, that's why this regulation is so important. So cabbage seed crops, the acres can be anywhere as low as, in some years it might be as low as you know 800 acres or even less. In some years it could be several thousand acres. But that's not a lot of acres. And the company that makes that fungicide has no not, financial is not has no financial incentive to register because there's a significant financial cost to registering a chemical on on a new crop and they're not going to do that unless there's it, an easy way to get it registered so this is a really important way to and get, the value of the crop too that's increased lab yeah so th these crops are valued at anything from 12 to 16 thousand an acre so let me ask you uh brussels sprouts uh seed is uh that's got to be a pretty specialized crop. How many acres of Brussels sprout seeds are there in this area? I would say just, just under probably 100. Just under 100 acres? Yeah. Okay, just under 100 acres. And what percent of the U.S. or world supply does that represent? So two years ago it was about 83 percent, I believe. Of the U.S. supply? Of oh. worldwide. And I, it's gone down <laughs> since then because more companies okay. are getting into okay, it. But. But, so a couple years ago, less than 100 acres of Brussels sprout seed represented 83 percent of the world Brussels sprout seed. Brussels yeah. sprout seed. So it makes if you're like Brussels sprouts <laughs> it's very important to control these diseases. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes it is. Yeah and, yeah. and, and you know with, with a disease like black leg the, the black leg pathogen it's very readily seed borne and it's very readily seed transmitted. So in the 19 in around 1970s early 1970s there was an outbreak of black leg in cabbage crops on the east coast and midwest and it was all tied to seed growing in the northwest and it had a huge impact on the seed industry and that's the reason why the seed industry is so proactive and so self-disciplined about saying we want this quarantine even if it requires us destroying a crop because we cannot afford to have a reputation of being a black leg infested area this area why is there vegetable seed here why is there not cabbage grown in eastern Washington or in yeah. California or in Missouri. So it kind of goes back to what Jack was saying. So cab cabbage is a biennial, so it means mm -hmm. it takes two years to, to make it flower and produce seed. And 
The reason is it has to go through that cold exposure period, the vernalization. And vernalization, as Jack was saying, if your plant's too big, it's going to winter kill. If it's too small, it's not going to vernalize. It'll survive, but not bolt and not flower the next year. So you need it'll be like the, that the right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'll be like this, <laughs> not flower versus a flowering crop. So cabbage has to be exposed to a long enough and cold enough period to make it flower. But if it's too cold, like central Washington winters, it'll kill. Cabbage will not survive the winter in the east side. If it's not cold enough, like you try and do it in California, it's not going to flower. So you have to have the right latitude? amount. Of, is it at latitude? It's, it's not so much latitude because this is not a day length uh, okay. flowering. It's it's a vernalization uh, flowering okay. species. So it, it has to. Marine influence it, So it needs a mild maritime climate. So other places that they grow um, brassicas for seed, the biennial brassicas for seed, are places like parts of South Africa, parts of Chile, parts of New Zealand. Tuscany. Tuscany France. and New Zealand are probably our, our hardest competition. So you talk about our marine environment. Mm -hmm. How far are we from saltwater? Uh, probably five miles as a crow flies, if that. So we, we do have to, for isolation purposes, kale and Brussels sprouts are grown farther east. Because, because they're cross-pollinating with cabbage. Yeah, they have to be five miles. Eat cabbage, is, cabbage from cabbage, well, green cabbage from green cabbage is a mile. Green cabbage from Savoy is two miles. Red cabbage is five miles. Kale is five miles. Yeah. Brussels sprout. All these types have it's to be really complicated. Separated. Keeping yeah. the isolations. Yeah. <laughs> it's because very it, because if you get cross pollination, your harvested seed is going to be the wrong genetics. So you're not going to be able to sell it. This is that, and the fact that you have to go a five-year rotation. Yeah. It just and, it, and if you bring up a crop like spinach, our growers on 10 to 15-year rotation because we have soils yeah, that are really conducive to certain pathogens such as fusarium wilt and and even with a 15 year rotation i've seen a literal 100 percent wipeout on a 15 year rotation with highly susceptible parent lines mm -hmm. and so cabbage is five years thankfully and it's considered short in the seed world <laughs> because you get to a crop like spinach and it's 10 to 15 year rotation i'm, I'm beginning to see why trading land yeah. Is, is so important yeah. and valuable. Because if you're on a 10 to 15 year rotation for spinach, you don't have enough land to stay on your own farm every year and do the isolation thing. Mm -hmm. it, you, you're going to have to switch land, swap land. And that raises all the complications of tracking what that land had for the last 15 years so that there aren't any complications like herbicide carryover that because spinach is, taught, is sensitive to most herbicides. And we've seen cases where yeah. there was um, some of the information on that history of what was grown there wasn't quite conveyed to the seed grower and the herbicides ended up devastating the seed crop. So there's a lot to track. <laughs> Lindsay, what is this R2-D2 looking machine? <laughs> so this is a, what we call a spore trap. You can see the, the, the vein on it. This thing is directed based on where the wind's blowing. And there's a little orifice that, at the end here where this air is sucked in. You can kind of hear a little bit if you get close enough. And it's got a, a vials inside that capture the air. And we're testing that air to see what spores are, are blowing around in the air. We specifically have been using this to monitor for the black leg pathogen in cabbage sea crops because it's a quarantine pathogen. And we, if, if it's here, we want to know whether it survived through the winter. We have a problem with trying to eradicate it. At the moment, we're actually using this trap to detect the potato late blight pathogen because right across the ditch here is a potato crop. And this climate, cool and wet, this is the absolute perfect condition for late blight and it's very explosive under these conditions. So we're trapping for the late blight pathogen so growers can be aware of when they need to spray in, in these high risk situations. And Jack, what, uh, what crop is this? Uh, this is beef, table beef, for a, a domestic company that'll be seed used crop. domestically. So this, is a, this, this seed will produce like just a, a, rig, a red table beef? Yes, actually this particular variety is for uh, dye, a natural dye. And this will really? be used, this will be used for dyeing your corn chips red. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> no. But but, but this essentially is a, this is a this, this is a table a, a, a red, beet, red table beet. Red table beet crop. Well that is pretty interesting. How many fields of this kind of seed are there for this particular variety? This is the one one of a kind right here. In for, the world. For that use. For that use. For that this use. is so if you have a crop failure here. I know, I know, heaven forbid, <laughs> then that means that use is gone because this is the, this is this. the field for that seed, for that variety, 
period. Our customer maintains an inventory. So it would mean it would it would hurt, but it wouldn't be totally lost. But they'd but, need to make up for but it next year. Next year I'd be going twice as much. Yeah. One of the things that is very clear is this agriculture is, is diverse, it's specialized. Um, we're looking at this open pollinated red table beet for dye. Um, <laughs> you you don't get to this level of specification without having a lot of information and a lot of, lot of research. And um, Jack, I want to ask you, how important is research information, and particularly from Washington State University, how important is that to your growing operation? Uh, we wouldn't be doing what we do, able to do what we do without Lindsay and WSU. Washington State University supports us in, uh, in all aspects. When we have a problem like the blight last year, Lindsay is on it. Um, I at, call her up and say, can you have time to go look at a field? And she says, well, I'm off work at four, where do we meet? And we'll go walk a field. And Lindsay's dedication, uh, it, she just goes above and beyond the call. She's a big, big part of uh, Skagit Valley agriculture and she carries her, she's renowned around the world for doing what she does. And she helps out other countries she just, I can't say enough about oh, thanks, what Lindsay Jack. does. <laughs> okay, and so uh, we have Lindsay that will work in the vegetable seed disease area, but we have around here, we have a small fruit pathologist. We have, yeah. WSU has a, 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 a small fruit entomologist, a horticulturist, uh, you weed know, we, 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 weed science. And so um, you don't get to have this caliber of, of agriculture with, without research. And Very true. Um, there are over 40 different commodity groups in the state of Washington that self-assess themselves for money to fund research, whether it be the Puget Sound Seed Growers Association, the Washington Blueberry Commission, the Columbia Valley, what's it called? Columbia Basin Vegetable Seed Columbia Association. Columbia Basin Vegetable Seed Association. You have to the, Columbia Basin Onion Research Association, the Pacific Northwest Vegetable Association, uh, uh, Potato Commission, Wheat Commission, Apple Commission, Fruit Commission, uh, Alfalfa Seed Commission, Mint Commission, <laughs> it, it goes on and on. Yeah. And most of that money, in fact, in, in all those cases, most of that money goes to Washington State University. It does go to, uh, it does go to private sectors. We, I know the Commission on Pesticide Registration funds USDA, it will fund stuff in Oregon State University, we fund stuff in the University of Idaho, but Washington State University plays an absolutely pivotal role in generating information and working with Don McMorn, who right now is holding up the umbrella over the camera, <laughs> and he's involved in disseminating that information, and you do research as well, don't you, Don? Yeah, I got a cover crop trial at the station. Yeah. So bottom line is research is critical and Washington State University is uh, is the leading provider of or generator of research uh, research information and one of our concerns in agriculture has been the declining state and federal support for land-grant institutions so that is is probably one of our bigger threats to agriculture is uh, not enough uh, public funding for agriculture research.